at 6.30, we'll call the meeting to order. And then first order of business is public comment. If you have a comment, please come to the podium, state your name and address, and address your comments to the board and not to the audience, and then you have three minutes. No takers? Okay. Item number three, discussion and preservation bar easement, public hearing. So I officially open the public hearing. If anybody would like to speak to the issue. Ms. I guess I Jenkins? must be it. Are you, You're the you volunteer. <laughs> You're the speaker. I'm the volunteer of the night. <laughs> Trisha Jenkins, Heritage Commission. I believe we have two barns we're looking at tonight. One, the brown barn, which we refer to, we have referred to as the Meeker barn, and the Heritage Commission is very happy to have that one. No, no issues there. And the other is the um, oh, Rockwell. 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 Rockwell, yes. And that has been on the roll, and we're happy to keep that one as well. Any comments from the board members? No, no, we'll support the issue. Very Anybody good. else have anything that would like to say? Nope. All right. Um, I'm. Go set. I move to approve the Brown application for a discretionary preservation easement <coughs> on the barn for a 10 year period and a 75% reduction in the assessment assessed value and authorize the town administrator to work with the town council and the property owner on drafting the easement document. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? No. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. All right. I move to approve the Rothwell application for a discretionary preservation easement on the barn for a period of our 10 year period and a 75% reduction in assessed value and to authorize the town administrator to work with town council and the property owner on drafting the easement. Uh, second? Second. Any discussion? No. Nope. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Uh, I officially close the public hearing. Mm -hmm. Item number four, Steve Bullock, Highway Supervisor. <coughs> it is summer attire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, we got a flagpole donated to the town when they did the Mast Way School. And it's sitting over at the highway garage, and I didn't know if you guys had any ideas on what you wanted to do with it. It's about 30 feet long, and it's aluminum with a golden brass top. So they took it down from where that mast was. Yes, and then I guess at some point they had to start it <coughs> and they wanted to give it to the town and they said that they would take it. And then they needed it out of there, so we went and got it the other day and I was just sitting behind the building right now. Where do we need a flagpole? Little Rubble Park already has one. Right? Yep, yep. We got one yeah. in front of the town hall. I don't know if we need another one. You will. When? When you build the next building. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it's very... Mr. Tappan? This is very obvious. John Tappan speaking as a member of the Town Center Vision Committee. And in some of the uh, plot plans that the architect drew for the Town Center, uh, there was an additional uh, flagpole. Um, and in fact, it was 30 feet. Um, aluminum flagpole, and that was listed as a cost by owner. <coughs> so maybe you've already paid for it if that turns out to be in the plans. Well, can you store it for us? Yeah, to do some. I, I have no idea how to store them where they don't. Because I don't know if you if you leave it on its side if it's gonna bend in heat. Or so is it metal? No. Is it metal? Well, it's aluminum, but... Oh, it's aluminum? Yes. Okay. I, I'll do research and we can try to store it. Just fill it full of sand and set it somewhere. Mr. Van Aken? No, you might have a place. I'll talk to you later on. Over at my place. Up on the wall. All right. Yep. All right. 
Yeah, because the one in Little River Park gets um, scarborough glass. I believe it's not so. metal. So, metal one would be good. All right. Then the next thing on the list is um, there's been a lot of talk about the trash on the sides of the roads and people picking it up and stuff like that. And I noticed it after the snow started melting and I'd been thinking about it long before <coughs> the people had started talking about it and what I was thinking about doing was trying to set something up. <coughs> Like what the state used to use and then adopt a highway thing except using, trying to get people from the town to volunteer to do it so i'm just going to speak in hypotheticals so like the board of selectmen could adopt a road and you could do a road one of you guys live on or the heritage commission could pick a road and do one or you get a company in town to adopt a road and do it um the problem with doing it is you'll get a lot of people the first year or two to do it because they're all gung-ho and want to go do it and then they realize what they're actually picking up off the side of the road and then they don't want to do it anymore and then you start falling flat because uh, in my previous employment i didn't sign people up for the adopt a highway or put the signs out but it was up to me to stay on them to go pick it and then keep track of bags, give them all the pickers and the signs and everything they need and keep them going because they were supposed to pick four times a year. I'd be lucky if I could get them to pick twice. And in the plan that I was coming up with, I thought it would be easier to have people that live near the roads that they sign up to pick because it doesn't really make much sense to me to have someone that lives and Thurston Woods drive all the way over to Newtown Plains to pick the side of the road. Um, if we were to go forward with the program, the initial, you have an initial upfront cost, you have to buy signs, trash pickers, and vests for the people to wear. The blue bags that you get come from New Hampshire the Beautiful, so those don't cost anything. So once you get the program started in your initial startup, it's free. <coughs> Um, and the other thing that I thought about doing was something along the lines that uh, they do on the state roads, and that's if a business in town adopted a road like Tuttle Road or whatever, is to put a sign up that says this area is adopted by them. Because at least if they're going to do stuff like that, they'll get some kind of ownership over the road and they'll get some advertising. <clears throat> or if I don't know if Thurston Woods has a homeowners association, but you know, Thurston Woods Homeowners Association. Okay, they could adopt a road and it could get put up on a sign like that. At least it gives them some ownership over it, and maybe they'll keep doing it. But I've been hesitant to just let people go pick stuff on the side of the road, and I've said things in emails to like Julie, <coughs> and then of course today comes on the news that they've been finding one pot meth labs on the sides of the roads again. Yeah. And you can't, the, the stuff that you pick up on the side of the road is not nice. Hence the things that you see, you gotta get trained on what's there. Or else the town's gonna be held at a liability. I mean, someone just goes and starts picking trash and then they pick one of those up, don't know what it is and it blows up, it's not good. Any questions? So we're kind of talking about two different things, I think. One is, this was prompted by, I think you maybe saw on Facebook, a number of people kind of talking about a roadside pickup. A lot of towns do that, usually in April, because it's spring and stuff is exposed, and it's Earth Day. And, um, and then the adopt a highway is probably year-round in the sense that whenever a particular group wants to go do it, they organized to go do it. So I'm not sure which of these two things or which direction, if any, that we want to head in. I mean, obviously, it's too late for Earth Day this year. I don't know whether we want to just try to organize one for next year, whether we want to try to organize something for the fall. And these are all the town roads, right? Yes. It'd be easier to organize one for the fall because once you start getting 
the leaves and the grass, how you can't really see as much. So after you get that first frost, it goes back and everything dies back and you can really see. Same with once the snow goes away. Well, I kind of like, I like the idea, number one. I think we're very conscious around here about recycling. Um, I do like the part about uh, businesses that say, I'm going to adopt this piece of road, and we put their little sign out there that says, taken care of by the business yes. itself. I think it's a great idea. And there's other groups around here, like Boy Scouts and others, yes. that might decide to take on certain areas. So I'm going to suggest, with the chairman's permission, to move forward and look into it. And at least you look into it, think of some kind of plan. Yeah. Maybe there's roads you don't want them to pick at, and well, see, you do. Yeah, I wouldn't pick roads, development roads, because 90% of the development roads are people's front lawns. Exactly. You'd want to do Tuttle Road, Fox Garrison, the cut-through roads that you see a lot of traffic on that don't necessarily aren't on people's front yards. Who takes care of the little triangle out here? The state, isn't it? The state property. State property. Oh, you do? <laughs> well, we, we have the, our association has all of George Bennett and up to the first bridge on um, the Oak Road. So this is a fine example, so I'd like to move forward with it. What, where would you get the training for the people so they don't pick up things that I can do it. I have all the literature on it. Okay. You don't. It, it's pretty much just PSAs. You see this. Yeah. Mark it. Don't touch it. And then you have someone like Tom go out and get them. Because I mean, mm -hmm. you pick needles up. You, and a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, in terms of walk me through, because you get people to go out pick up the stuff. They use the blue bags. They leave them on the side of the road. So is it you? Then, or is it, then no. Who? Then it would be us that goes out and picks them up. And then you just bring them to the transfer station. <coughs> yes. Well, and at that point, I'd recommend that after what you pick up off the side of the road, probably is best not to be recycled. Yeah, I agree. Because <laughs> <laughs> the things that are inside some of the bottles, and plus, the, it's what you're picking up is not going to be clean. Mm -hmm. Still going to have liquid in them. So, and you don't know what the liquid is, so you don't want to open the bottles to empty it out. It's, and what <coughs> little you're going to get. The first few times you go do them, you're probably going to get a lot of them been done in a while. Mm -hmm. But if you do them fall and spring, eventually you're going to get to a point where you're not picking up that much stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Vanek, can you have a comment? Yeah, as long as we, when we go do this program, as long as they separate it, what do they put for like needles or any... They can't pick needles they should be taken. You don't pick it up, but we can look at it. And as long as it goes in a separate bag before it gets to us. And then I got to put it into a dozen location so when I have a transport, at least I can let the driver know and has does the transportation uh, spot to dump it at the site. So I need to know if any of that stuff is going to come over. So anything that's hazardous there. needs to stay on the side of the road. They're not allowed to pick up anything more than a gallon with liquid, no five gallon buckets. Okay. Needles and stuff that they have suspicion about just Mark it, leave it on the side of the road, and have someone from the town go look at it. Mm -hmm. Which is the way it was before. If they found something like that, it was up to us to go get it. And then they'd leave the blue bags, we'd go get the blue bags and bring them to this area. Mr. Brown? I don't, I don't have any comment. I, I mean, it's just, it's fraught with issues. <clears throat> And then when you start talking about needles and you know what's in the bottle and so on, it, it uh, it's got some some real issues that go along with it. So I don't know what the training's like. Uh, is it? Uh, I mean, we bring them up here and <clears throat> no, we used to do it right on the side of the road before they went out. That's why they didn't open bottles up. If you picked up a bottle, a glass bottle or any other bottle that had liquid, it just went in the bag. You left it on the side of the road. If the bottle looked expanded or distorted, you left it, marked it. Somebody would go look at it after and pick it up. Here's the ones that you don't want to pick up look. They, they look funny. I'm, I'm more concerned about the ones that get out there that maybe haven't been trained or whatever. You know, they take their kids with them and say, come on, we're going to go pick up trash or some well, of that's the why I was adolescents to or teenagers. That's why I was trying to set up a program so we could have kind of control over that. Because the Adopt-A-Highway program Tom does 
if you're under the age of 18, you need to sign a permission slip. We want them to wear vests, right? Yes. Okay. Do we provide those? Yes. Or? Okay. You can get fairly cheap vests for that. And if you were under the age of 16, you had to have one adult for every kid under the age of 16 if you were on the side of the road making trash. So you, in the um, thing for the, uh, that Julie had sent out, the actual sign-up sheet with all the permission slips that explains everything is the 43 pages is what the state uses now for people to sign up to pick it. Okay. I, I would, if we're going to do anything, my suggestion would be let's maybe try to organize a roadside cleanup in the fall, see how it goes. Okay. And the signs you were talking about? Are Just letter crew ahead signs. Yeah, so that's so people will slow down on the particular. Yeah, they give you a warning that you're out there. People are okay. So I would suggest that uh, I like the idea we move forward. I'd like to put something in the crier ahead of time so people can anticipate this. Once you start developing more of a plan, how you want to handle it, obviously you've got to coordinate it yeah. uh, to make it work. And that way there you can say, don't, all those things you just told us, you can put in Lee Cryer, don't touch this and don't touch this. So there's some training up front as well. Yeah, and then ideally the people that would sign up to go do it, I could make a packet for them to exactly. leave and give it to them a week before it happens and then go over it again on site. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think that's very important. Yep. Any concern, Chief Drumshill? No. no. And we can put the message board out as well. Oh, and the road that's... Yeah. yeah. We that's a good idea. We had it out on uh, Lee Hill. It got canceled, but we had it out there. And it just says, caution, litter, pick up ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Anything else? You know, like, it's a good idea. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry. Toby Van Aken, Transfer Station Manager. Uh, good evening. And uh, I'd just go over a couple of things, maybe just one thing now at this point. Uh, um, in a few months, we're going to be changing our tickets for, um, for the vehicles for entering permits and stuff like that. Um, there's other alternatives out there that I'm looking into that it, instead of using stickers, because a lot of residents don't want to put on their vehicles now these days, and some of them leave them in their other vehicles and stuff like that. And it's very difficult to keep track who's in town and who's not, and it's especially the staff we have now. And I'm uh, just throwing it out there, maybe there's other op opportunities that we can do to, in order to, since we got these cameras, maybe. We could try to do something to, uh, instead of doing stickers, maybe do, I don't know, the scale bars or something like that on the registration to identify the vehicle that they are that they are from the town of Lee, or something. I'm just throwing it out there, what we could do to, you know, handle instead of purchasing these, these uh, tickets, which is costing a couple of grand to do a lot of this stuff, and I still have quite a number of them left over, that, and also there's quite a few people in the town that don't have stickers. So we're trying to, since we have a few months left uh, before we start doing this in October and November, we, that's when we start making adjustments and changes for the following the next couple of years, that there's something we could do to make it easier for all of us in the town to keep a lot of the outside people coming in. My like, furthest people I've been seeing is coming from PBD Mass. They're coming out because we're in, uh, we're online. We're the only ones open for that day, so they decided to drive all the way out here and try to dump their trash and stuff like that. So that's, <laughs> that's the first I've ever seen it. heard from it. But uh, I'm just throwing it out there. Maybe something we could do to make it, you know, if we have to go back to this, the, what we've been doing for stickers, but maybe any suggestions that we could do move forward. You know, there's other towns that have been doing uh, um, cards that I brought up to the, the uh, Solid Waste Committee. They're doing little um, cards with a chipping it and uh, swiping it and the gauge just goes up or whatever. I don't know how they do it. I haven't gone to see the facilities, stuff like that around, but I'm going to be doing some road trips, but any ideas to make it simple, easy, and cost effective, and, and we can move forward since we do investing in all these cameras. So, Question, Chief? Uh, was, um, the, you were talking about putting something on the registry, you talking about on the license plate? No, the uh, reg uh, registration. Off the registration, maybe a, a small sticker 
on there on the window, or and then we can actually do like a uh, maybe uh, like an easy pass to say, all right, he's they're from the town of Lee. If they're not from the town of Lee, if that well, you're, you're in the same, you're back in the same boat though. You, you got to depend on the per rely on the person to get that, which is the problem we're having now is not all residents are going to get their sticker. Right. Yeah. I think the way to avoid it is um, when people register their car, they're handed exactly. their sticker at that time. Exactly. We that thing does that right now. It's more of a resident sticker um, than it is just a transfer station sticker. So we can monitor it when they go get sand and salt um, over the highway garage. Um, just about anything. Um, so it's, it's issued. So if somebody comes in and doesn't have it, then they're, but there there needs to be it needs to have some teeth. We can't just say, well, we're going to do this, and then the next person comes in and doesn't have it, and we're like, oh, okay, sorry. They're, you know, they need to know there's some ramification if you don't have that once it's issued to you. So the family comes in, they register the car. Well, we got the minivan, we got the truck. Okay, well, they all get it. it has to be on the lower right hand, lower left hand corner of your windshield. Um, well, you can't use the facilities. You know, I, I stopped the vehicle in there several weeks ago. Vermont plates had half of a about a four-year-old um, sticker on it. So, you know, there's got to be, you know, if you know that every car that comes in there is going to be required to have that sticker, if it's not there, then you need to go talk to that person and say, here's the deal. And, you know, it needs to be documented whether you call us and we come down and we write them a warning and we can enter it into our computer. And then if it comes up against it, you know, you were warned. But there needs to be more follow-up and something to happen rather than all oh, just you know don't do it again. And then they come through, and if it was Toby that warned them, and Toby's not there that day, and somebody else is, well then they slide through again. Yeah, that's what they go. That's been happening quite a bit. So even though what we say and what we do is still it continues, it happens and happens. And happens. Even though it's a mandatory, I know it says mandatory right up there, but mm -hmm. we just need something the next step to. Is there? How any, enforce it. Is there any teeth that the state gives us in terms of imposing some kind of fine for people that... Well, I mean, really what should happen is if they don't have a sticker, they can't use the transfer right. station. Right. Exactly. And you have to have somebody there, and you have to have somebody checking the stickers for all the cars. I mean, every town I've ever lived in, like you said, you get the sticker when you register your car, and <clears throat> you can't that's... use the facility without the sticker. So, obviously we can't I think it's a good idea, but we can't move that way because half the, I've already registered my car already, so they'd have to come in separately get us ticket, right? Well, we could. I mean, we could start it yes. at any time. Yeah. Can they just, have dates you know, on? Once you go a cycle, everybody yeah. should end up with it, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. like, I like that idea. I think it's a way to go. I do too. We should investigate it and move forward. The other issue is I had thought a while back, several years ago, we talked about this. Maybe you were police chief at the time about people who do come here and try to dump and you charged them if they wanted to. Yeah. I mean, it, it's obviously if they're a Tunnel Lee person they're supposed to have a sticker and they're allowed to dump it. Same. But however, if they got the low ear and they don't have the sticker, they should be able to be charged to dump in right. that low. Well, I think it, yeah, yeah, on the face of it I'd say yes, but it depends on just what it is they're trying to dump on us. I mean, well, of course, yeah. You know, so so then you're in the business of screening it. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yes, no, whatever. I, I, I think we, that there could be some exceptions. Obviously, if somebody shows up, you know. And, but well, if you've got you know, a family member comes up to clean, dad passed away and they came up to clean the house up. Oh, yeah, you know. Yeah. Okay, but we have temporary. Right, but I mean that's we, we have to make that known. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the idea of having a Lee resident pet pass mm -hmm. issued when they register their car, eventually you're going to get everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think it's really yeah, good. We, we we've got the transfer camera. station now. We've got that. We got cameras. We got a little. We're going to park these things all over where the right. the resident yeah. sticker yeah. will help you as well. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. So what can we implement it to? We just need to know how much the whole thing is going to well, We're going to have to talk to Linda um, yeah. because she'll be the, they'll be the ones doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next stickers that are purchased should not have an uh, expiration date Right, it should say them. resident. Right. And then you can... We usually do it in October, so 
No, no it's not going to work like that. It's not going to work like that. I know, but if we can implement it sooner, the better. Probably this fiscal year, just so we get mm -hmm. a few weeks. To like I said, mine has the date of, it, of my registration. Right. You just yeah. go by that. Yeah. When you got to yeah. get a new one, think, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty sure I get a new one every year. Yeah. They'll just write the date on it. Yep. So how would it work? I live in Lee. I get my little registration. I've gone to the transfer station to do my stuff. I move out of town. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what stops me? Somebody's going to have to notice one here. Is there going to be a date on when it expires? Yes. Or is there going to be a color? It's going to be a date. Well, that's what we'll have to figure out. Your registration. Because if I'm, I'm just thinking about that, you can still come back and do it. I'm just still thinking about who's going to monitor this. It's easier to see a color than to see, oh, what's that date? Right. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe the renewal is changes color every single Just like, you know, you know inspection stickers for a different yeah. color, but yeah. do it that way. That's true. You'll make them red for the remainder of 2019 and make them blue for 2020 and mm -hmm. um, just change the color, you know. Each year. Well, that's just going to have to be something that Toby and Linda or whoever it is right. needs to kind of get that on. Because I don't know, you, you send these out, right, Toby, to, in terms of somebody prints them for you and then you get yeah, them, right? right. So right. you have to see if the vendor can. Right. And I think we probably going to have to look at the placement um, of the decal as well because uh, at lower left hand corner of some of these vehicles now, the windshield is going down below yes. where the hood line comes oh, up. Um, yeah. So, you know. Well, we'll probably have to look at that, you know, maybe a side window or something. Um, so as the vehicle comes, it's easy to see them having to be in front of the vehicle when it comes in. You know, for us, even the inspection stickers, especially the new location, there's a little bit of glare. Mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to see on that front windscreen. Mm -hmm. So but we can, I can work with Toby on that. We can figure mm -hmm. it out. And there might be something else out there. Too. Yeah. 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 And Tom, you had said about the fact that we don't have any teeth on our regulations if someone wants to dump and doesn't have a ticket. Well, we should be able to stop them, right? Well, we get, I turn them around. Well, I try to turn around, but i got to be careful what I say. So you if we them. catch them, especially now the camera system, yeah, we charge them with unlawful activities. It's okay. called littering. But I'm, I'm talking about if they're coming in without a dump sticker yeah. on. There needs to be something rather than just, oh, don't do that. Don't do it again. Yeah. Um, because then they'll be, even the next time they'll have that. Significant other come through. Oh no, you, no, you oh, that was been white. You didn't tell me. Um, so I don't know if that's an, an ordinance that maybe we have to come up with. Well, can you work on that? Please? Yeah, yeah I'm still being you together. Yeah, so we're going to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. There's something in the Solway's ordinance that says something like that, but not that. Good. Okay. I like the okay. <clears throat> Larry, you heard it. Hurricane Park, 12 Lee Hill Road. Um, one suggestion I'd like to make with regard to the sticker, I'm one of those that doesn't like to put stickers on my vehicle. Uh, okay. Right? Um, is to either make it much smaller or something that would be less obtrusive. Less of, yeah. <laughs> obtrusive. You know what word I'm looking for. But I don't like putting stickers on. The only stickers I have is the registration sticker mm -hmm. and the uh, the police association sticker, and that's the only ones that I would put on my truck. So I'd suggest that you think about some way for those of us that don't want to put stickers. I know you don't want to put them all over your bed. So I true, it but I don't drive it. You know, don't take, you know, <laughs> don't drive it. <laughs> but anyway, just my. You can always stuff. hang it on the rear view mirror. <laughs> yeah. It's transferable. But. Yeah, well, that's the idea that it is transferable. <laughs> if you have three cars, then you can. Small triangle rather yeah. than just a square. A triangle will stick out. It would <laughs> when you look at it. So we come up with a small triangle or something. We can look at that. Be interesting. Is there anything out there, Toby, that's like RFID or something like that? So yeah. that when they pull in, it logs who it is. And if it sees something moving and it doesn't have our RFID, it Lots of lights and sirens come in and SWAT teams come, come, come in. And I don't know if there's something like that that would. So then you don't have to have somebody sitting there watching every single car. Well, that's the thing. It's, it's, you have to sit there and you got to watch this and make sure that the stickers are on the vehicle. But um, I don't know if it's sort of reasonable. I mean, every other, state, every other town, city in the state does it. Yeah, I know. 
Just, I'm trying to take I think the, Derry has one of those things that's electronically they think. Why don't we just look and see what's out there? Yeah, let me I go out there and do the road trip and find out what's out there. Uh, they might be surprised then, what's yeah. out there. Do a vacation road trip. Thank you. Anything else with number five? Okay. Yes, we're good. Number six, Larry Kinberg, Recreation Commission Chairperson. Okay, we're back to doggy waste. <laughs> um, I'd like to request that we get three more doggy waste stations to put at Little River Park. Um, we have an entrance on Lee Hill Road across from my house that people enter, myself included, uh, would be a good spot to put at that juncture of the upper trail. Another one at the bottom of the uh, entrance to the upper trail down at the end of the parking lot. And then another one over um, on the river trail, going leading down to the river trail. There's a sign there, but there's no station with the bags. And I would suggest that we put three of those in that would help, hopefully help with that. Has the, um, the Take 5 people done the other ones yet? So maybe they might want to sponsor these? Maybe? I don't know. Or somebody else might. The doggy daycare place. Yeah. Or maybe some other group might want to sponsor it. Yeah. Well, friendly pet. It's an idea. Yeah. First of all, I think it's a good idea. I don't want to have waste all over the ground at this point. Well, I was thinking to take five people because they would pick it up. Mm -hmm. I don't know about maybe friendly pets, but other businesses might not pick it up, right? Yeah, yeah. They might want to sponsor it, but then you need somebody to pick up the well, they bags. The bags. Yeah. yeah. So I don't just I don't just a start. Well, I'd like to move forward with it anyway. Okay. All right. See what you can do with it. Do you want to take that on, Larry, or are you just? Proposing that it be well, I was proposing it because you guys took yeah. care of it the last time. But if you want us to look into it and see what we can do, I, I would like you to look into it, see if there's a place that would want to sponsor it. Put that on the list, John. Absolutely, we'll do it. Thank okay. you. Uh, the second item uh, last year we had quite a discussion of pickup soccer um, at the uh, music uh, nights on Thursday night. Um, the Red Commission would like to offer. And I don't see any reason why we can't, because a private citizen wants to organize and run a pickup soccer on the uh, music nights for the kids. Um, and the Rec Commission feels that it would be a good opportunity to get more people out to the park at music night that they bring their kids. And kids may not be particularly interested in it, but if there's some sort of semi-organized activity for them <coughs> that's not run by us because we're limited in manpower, but uh, uh, Josh Carlton has offered to do that, not as maximum velocity, but as a private citizen of Lee. So I just wanted to bring that to the select board to see, I spoke with Julie about it, and she suggested that I bring it to the select board to see if there's any particular issue with that. I'm not talking about advertising maximum velocity or anything like that, it would just be a private citizen organizing some kids at the music nights. Okay, just with respect to uh, I understand the parents and the children, mm -hmm. uh, where would the kids play? Far enough away so they don't interfere with the music? Oh yeah, they'd be out on the multi-purpose field. Uh, the, so yeah. they'd be over there somewhere? Yeah, and that's not going to be an issue. Yeah. And you don't see any trash issues or anything like that? No more than we got now. No more than we got now. I walk down there every couple of days and I pick up trash. But you, know. you do? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I walk the trails every night. So I assume the fields are available on Thursday nights when you go there. Nobody's already requested them. No, it's usually after. You know, if somebody has a request <coughs> in for a field, you know that would be one thing. But this would be if nobody's using the field. Oh, okay. Um, it wouldn't interfere with any organized activities okay. that have been reserved. We haven't run into that. We haven't noticed that. Okay. I'm just asking you last year. You don't think it would interfere with music night at all? I don't think so. Okay. If it does, we'll change it. But, okay. you know, I think it's something we ought to try. And yeah, well, music night is just, it's become so, I mean, popular. I think it's, a, you know, I don't want anything that erodes that, you know, gives people a bad feeling about it, whatever. So. 
No, with the kids out on the multi-purpose field, I think yeah. it's far enough away. So, okay. <clears throat> um, and there's one other thing I'd like to just mention, if I could. We'd spoken before about lighting the pavilion, <coughs> and I met with uh, Dave Air, Air Electric, uh, Sunday, uh, to take a look at that and see what the cost would be and <coughs> how much trouble it would be. And uh, I don't have a formal proposal yet, but he's thinking that the cost of it would probably be somewhere around $3,500, and that would be running the wiring from the current house, but we can do it through the conduit that's already in place, <clears throat> running some wiring up into the pavilion and using LED strip lighting uh, for an ambiance type of lighting, not direct lighting, but an ambiance type lighting that would provide some illumination in there <coughs> when it gets dark in August and so on. And then the other thing we were talking about doing was putting in some LED uh, spotlights because we use one end as sort of a stage area and just have two lights come in on one end and then do the same thing on the other end if we ever decide to turn it around and then everything would be controlled through switches in the, uh, in the house which would be locked up so that you know somebody couldn't just come down and turn them on um, but anyway I, I, we don't have a formal proposal yet we're going to discuss that at the recognition meeting tomorrow night and uh, and we're looking at our budget, and I think that we're going to have, <clears throat> I think we'll have enough surplus this year that it might cover that, so it wouldn't have to come out of any other funds. Okay. I think it's a good idea. But, I think. you know, I'll bring that as a formal proposal, hopefully, mm -hmm. on the 20th. Right. The fact that it'll be, the switches will be controlled in another building, that will be locked. Yeah, that'll be locked up. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Absolutely. And then, and then he's talking about putting in a couple of outlets up there, so if we need to, if we need to do something else in the future, there'd be some outlets up there. I would like you to uh, just uh, advise the Energy Committee about it, because I, at one time, they were talking about doing something with pavilion lighting, so. Okay. I don't think they're anywhere close to it, but I think it would be a, just a, a good thing to do. Well, I, I, I think it'd be important to get this in place uh, before the fall, yeah. so that we can extend it you know, the music night. I think it's just a courtesy, I think. Yeah. Tell them what's going on. We'll do. Sounds like a good plan. Um, can I ask you a question, Larry? Sure. Um, a little bit further on, we're going to talk about the no smoking policy mm -hmm. in that door one, which kind of affects Blue River Park. Are you planning on staying for that? I wasn't. Is there? Would you? Would you? Talk about it now. Yeah. Could, could you hang around just for a few minutes? Sure. It's, can you move that up, Julie, to yeah. be the first night? Yeah. <clears throat> Julie Bill, the town administrator. Thank you. So then we were, I think it was Mr. Bullock brought up at the last meeting, um, people smoking at the park, and at the time I said it was already in the policy, but there are no signs that it's in the policy. It isn't in the policy. Um, so did a little research and drafted uh, a policy. This one is just no parking at recreational fields and no parking. No smoking or use of tobacco products um, at recreational areas. Um, there are other towns in the state that have extended this to all town property, which we can talk about, but this is just focused based on our previous conversation on the recreational areas. So it's a fairly simple policy. Um, we would need to, if the board is interested in going forward, we would need to have a public hearing on it. Um, because I think you may hear from some people who don't like the idea. Well, it also mentions in there in, te in designated smoking areas. So we have it, to. It, only if we want to set one up. Yeah. I so just left that in there because some towns do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. So I guess the reason I asked Larry is can you bring this to your group and get their reaction to this and if there's any changes that they would suggest? Okay. Because there is contingents of people out there that do smoke. Um, I'm not one of them, but you know, if they're coming to events like at the fair and stuff like that, how are we going to deal with that? So, is there going to be a designated area for them just to go and do their thing, or we're just saying no smoking at all, go someplace else? So, well, I guess we should end the question then. Um, if we were to have a designated smoking area, where would it be? 
I mean, if you're going to talk to the committee about that, why not take that question up as well? Okay. So I would actually, I'd like the idea of moving forth, forward with this. I think it's important, especially, I'm not sure if I want to do the whole town right now, but at least start mm -hmm. off a, a beginning part with the recreational fields to begin with. Mm -hmm. And then if we could say, yes, we're not going to have any smoking, however, there is an ideal spot which you can go and do what you have to do. It's far enough away, maybe the parking lot or something that's away from the pavilion. That might be an area, and then we could put a receptacle there as well that people could. Oh, you would, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, put a receptacle so they can uh, put their butts in there and that kind of stuff. I think that would work out real nice. So if you can at least bring that up, I think pretty good. But at the same time, so I'll ask the chief, so what if someone's smoking and it says no smoking? What do you do? We tell them, give them a warning first time. Tell them to put it out and yeah, to put it out. you know take down their information and once again same with the the transfer well, station stickers we write out a warning slip and put enter it out the when the police car turns in the park anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's what he's got to. But the, the fines that are listed in the policy those are enforceable, right? Mm -hmm. These are enforceable the fines. The right. yeah. Yeah. It's just like our, our noise ordinance, <laughs> our open container ordinance, and we write out right. what's called the hand summons and. They have 96 hours to pay the fine. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. Yeah. So let's move forward with that, please. Okay. okay. Are there other groups in town that we should pass this by? Uh, maybe the Conservation Commission. I didn't send it to the mm -hmm. department heads. No. Nope. There are any groups you would think of? Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um, at the last meeting, the board instructed me to advise department heads um, that employees were not to work regularly scheduled 12-hour days, 12-hour shifts. Um, I modified that um, to 10 hours just so that an employee wouldn't think that 11.75 hours. And there was a great deal of discussion ever since amongst department heads because that impacts other operations, uh, in particular the fire department. So I think that it would be a good idea for the board to talk about it again and maybe fine-tune what it is you really hope to accomplish. Um, I did confirm with uh, one of the labor attorneys that the board um, has pretty broad discretion, um, not necessarily in the fire department. The fire chief actually can dictate the hours of employment for his employees. But with all the other departments, certainly, if the select board wants to tell town hall employees you can't work 12-hour days, but tell some other department that you can, that's entirely at the board's discretion. So you don't need to, you don't need to make a blanket policy. It can be targeted to different departments if that's what you want to do. Chief Johnson, do you want to make some comments? <laughs> No, Chief never had to leave to uh, bring up apparatus and take fire on Brett with me. I think he, you know his his people already work twelve hour shifts, um, scheduled twelve hour shifts. That's the only way they can actually get the coverage they need to have people staffing in the morning and in the evening uh, to have adequate staffing. Um, so I do I do know that that Thank you for is impossible for him to adhere to. For us, um, it's a it does happen. It's a rarity, but it does happen uh, in order for us to be able to maintain the coverage we have, especially on weekends if somebody takes uh, vacation time or whatnot. Uh, it just happened this past weekend, as a matter of fact. Um, two people needed the time off on the same weekend, and uh, so I had our part-time officer who works 24 hours a week work two 12-hour shifts. Um, that was the only way to get the coverage. Um, Again, it's a rarity. That's the first time it's happened to us in quite a long time. But we don't know what's going to happen for us, for emergency services. It's always changing. Um, well, the directive um, didn't stop anybody from, with an emergency or an overtime situation, from having the employees work more than 10. Um, it was just, at the time, the board did not want employees regularly working. Right. Yes, things like this that come up, they're special like this, we would expect that safety comes first. Yeah. There's not much you can do about it. Like you said, it's not a regular part of their job function. Correct. It's just 
things coalesce and all of it happens. Except for the fire department, that is there. Which I do understand that is special prerogative there. And that's always been like that in the fire service. You work a 24 hour shift, then you have a couple days off, and you work a 48 hour shift, and um, fire service has always been like that. So maybe we can say we exempt the safety services from this particular policy? I think, I think we'd say that for all the first responders. I mean, I don't know what they come up against, you know, but. We, we were talking about your normal mm -hmm. business working day, mm -hmm. you know. We don't plan against the 12-hour work day or 10-hour, whichever, you know, we Well, select. except that the selectman's office, um, every other Monday, we work at least a 10-hour day and kind of typically, typically a 12-hour day. But that's the exception. That's well, the exception I'm talking about. Yeah, There's it, an exception we've, we'd approve. But that's not an exception is what I'm saying. So in other words, we wanted to try to craft a policy, as I did, that says regularly scheduled. We are regularly scheduled to work a 12-hour day. If what the select board wants to do is tell an employee in a more, let's just say, physically demanding job, like at the transfer station, we do not want you working more than a 10-hour day, emergencies aside, then you can tell the transfer station that. This, I think it's just the opposite. I think that we, we say, here's what we say a standard day is, and, and if, because of, for instance, the Monday night meetings and so on, that's an exception. You approve the exception, the same thing would be true, but it's not going to be something that's just becomes, uh, you know, standard practice to just work 12 hours, you know. Well, I, a lot of this came around um, several years ago in a different administration. And I think it was Carol Dennis at the time was chairman of the board. And part of the issue is it was targeted for the recycling center, uh, you know, for the transfer station in the sense of um, working with, uh, we used to call it yellow lion, but obviously shovels and <coughs> You know any kind of machinery down there for 12 hours it, it's hard on people and that's a regularly foreseeable part of the job function i understand the issue associated with fire and I understand the association with police as well with respect to town administration i look at it this way you're not running machinery whatsoever it's not a demanding physical job like i would see people working in the transfer station so my vision on this even though it got broad a little bit was targeting only the transfer station to limit the 10 hours because of working with machinery long term, long part of the day. So it would not originally supposed to be applied to town hall employees. Now, I think um, we just dealt with this issue with respect to highway department, right? So you're working 10 hour days now? Yeah, we started doing 10s today. And yeah, this is a, a trial up to October, right? Yeah, I mean, if it doesn't work out, I'll just say it. I wasn't, I don't really have a lot to say about this because I'm not regularly scheduled to work more than 10. And you, if I have to work 12, 18, 19 hours, something's falling from the sky or something bad happens. Oh, yeah, that's a different stuff. So, don't there ain't there much I can do about that. But don't I, don't, I don't want to work 12 hours in a day, so, or I don't want to work more than 10 hours in a day. So. I'm sure your family doesn't want you either. No, so I wasn't. And the, the policy issue really didn't apply to the highway department, so it wasn't. Thank you. I think I think the other issue that comes up with the transfer station is uh, they provided us a list of all the projects and all the things and so on and so forth, um, but they don't necessarily have the resources to get all that done. So, so the question is, are you trading off the hiring of additional people to get to get the hours that you need to do all those things, or uh, do you look at extended extended work days? Well, I think I see where you're going at this point, and I would rather hire additional employee, another part-time person, to fill that gap so we would have a more safety or safer working environment. So um, yeah, I'm not against that. I'm just yeah, saying I, that's I, the trade-off. That, that is the trade-off, and so my. The trade-off with me is to go with another person, another half-timer or something, to try to fill that responsibility. But it would be the same number of hours, though. Still 40 working, hours a week. 40 hours a week, so there's no... I'm not sure where you two are going with this, because we're just talking about having somebody not work 
12 hours in a shift. Mm -hmm. So instead of working three 12 hour yeah. shifts and then four hours or doing well, whatever, well, the, you're just having them work four tens or you know five eights. Or, well, I, if, if you don't mind me filling in on that. Please. Well, see, if we, uh, see, if you go with the say for example, if you do 10 hours a day, and I'm looking for it, if you do something like that, that's great. It actually takes a load off of me. And, and also, if, you know, the safety aspect, you know, operating the semi equipment and stuff. But the part timers could come in a couple hours, an hour before, or two before, to get, so I could actually do some of these projects. They could do smaller projects to get a lot of this stuff done, versus I could also increase the hours for that full time worker. He does 30 hours to have actually 10 hours for that individual to do more work, to get be more productive on things, to get things completed. Mm -hmm. on that the series the list you have seen yes and that list is every little thing just keep coming up more and more things come up what we're doing is attacking the bigger things at this point mm -hmm. but I, I if you do 10 hours and we're open what uh, said it says on the side seven to six mm -hmm. uh, we're there at six to six mm -hmm. all right there's always some we overlap I overlap in the evening times especially on a Saturday there's only two of us on a Saturday and it gets pretty overwhelmed over there Mm -hmm. When you got two people, mm -hmm. um, it's pretty difficult, and it's, that's a long day. I don't get home till like seven, seven thirty at night sometimes. You know, after everything's all done, and you know, it makes twelve-hour days makes a long day for the guys. And the Do you friends. have people working twelve-hour days? There's times, uh, yeah, when somebody's sick or somebody's on vacation. Did, yes, I feel someone that. works it's regularly twelve-hour oh, yeah. days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone does work yes. regularly. Okay, now that's see, that's where we have an issue. That. We did that. I did that. All right. I had the the employee work when we were short-handed at the time. We needed someone to fill in in order to continue. We were short-handed a lot. There's nothing we could do at that point. Well, it's been an, it's been a long ongoing. Obviously, because it was discussed when Carol Dennis was here, which is at this point is four years ago. It's been an issue for at least four years. Oh, sure it was. So it has been. But. So. My feeling on this is that I want to stick with 10 hours, no more than 10 hours a day at the transfer station. That's where we're at right now. And the issue that the chairman was talking about if is if there's some reason that you can't get all your work done, I've always said to all the department heads that you bring it to the board and tell us why, and if we have to justify another position or half time, we're going to consider it. But if you can rework your schedule where you can get everything done, there's no need to hire somebody else. But there should be nobody working past 10 hours in the transfer station. So I, with the chairman's permission, I'd like to get a rewrite on this thing to focus that, that area. Yeah. That way I won't have to do exceptions for administrative staff or anybody else or, you know, safety people and fire people and so forth at this point. I was, I was in there on Saturday, and I don't remember the gentleman's name that was working the wall. He and I had a conversation. And he was there, and he, uh, it was about 4 o'clock, so he had to stay there till 6. And he was saying, geez, I'm getting dizzy because I've been here so long doing this. And working the wall is not exactly the most engaging thing. He's walking back and forth all the time. So I just don't want people to be there, and they get disoriented or whatever, dizzy, and they do something that's going to hurt somebody or hurt themselves. Time so it's more of a for... safety issue, at least for me, that I'd rather have them 10 hours is wasn't enough. Well, this is a little bit. But we yeah. have said we want somebody on the wall at all yeah. times. So you know that's you got to have a person. And well, yes, but it doesn't have to be the same, same person. person. No, it doesn't. Could work I, five I never hours said it had to be the same hours. person. But you got to have a person. Well, you can rotate people right. in and out. So, do you have any problems with your personnel? Mm, something I want to discuss at this point. Okay. Right. That'll be a problem in a non-public session. Yes, it's fine. <laughs> Good. Tonight. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, last week, Karen Rossi and I just discussed our concern that we may go over the legal budget. Um, as of right now, there's about sixteen thousand dollars left in the contingency mm -hmm. fund. So. My recommendation would be to hold off spending any of that money um, so that if we do need it for legal expenses, it will be there. Okay. 
oh, can you have Joanne do another one of those reports? She sent us a expense and revenue. Yeah, yeah, so do yes. it. Give us another uh, one. Expense and revenue or budget to actual? Uh, same thing. For, for revenue and expenses. Okay. But she did one two weeks ago. Okay. <clears throat> but she can do another one. And just keep them keep them coming. Well, I just I'm just asking because I now every two weeks do a budget to actual and send it to the department heads. Send it to send it to everybody? Well I, okay. I would like it. I don't these gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, I'd like that budget to actual. Okay. It keeps us informed anyway. Yeah. All right. Um, as you know, we received a resignation from Jacqueline Neal, one of the cemetery trustees. Um, although we have not received any written applications for the opening, because this is a position that the select board fills, um, there was a gentleman in today that is interested. Um, it's Joe, right? Jeff. Jeff. Jeff Laporto is interested. So we gave him an application just so that the board would have information on paper. So, um, and we'll put something in the prior mm -hmm. and let people know that there's an opening. And it's my understanding we don't have a sexting yet. Mm, to the best of my knowledge, we do not. So we have actually now finalized the LED project. I've mm -hmm. been waiting quite a while for the invoice and the. Um, final rebate from NHC, uh, and actually even beyond the numbers that I put in the agenda, I got updated numbers this morning, which is more to our favor. Um, so we received a total of $24,322 in rebates from NHC. Uh, so the total project uh, ended up costing the town $24,358, which was actually almost $3,000 less than what the select board had approved for the project. Mm -hmm. um, I've been sending you the monthly yep. uh, energy use reports. Um, so as you can see from that, we, we have started saving money. Yeah. What will be a true comparison will be really March, starting in March, because the project wasn't finalized January and February. Um, and then certainly after a year, we'll have a better idea, but it, we certainly appear to be on track for saving what we had estimated we could save, so. Great. Can we put something in the e-car when mm -hmm. you get some, yeah. maybe well, quarterly or something? Yeah. Just, yeah. that would be great. Okay. Um, can you tell us in terms of those rebates, are those discounts off the bill? They don't send us a big check, do they, or what are they doing? Uh, I actually had them discounted off the bill because otherwise we would not have been able to put the money back into the capital reserve fund. Okay. Yeah. So this way we're not losing the capital reserve fund, so to speak. Um, while I was meeting with NHEC to close out the project, when we met in town hall, he mentioned a few things about town hall, um, but one of the things he mentioned is that they do still have money to um, provide incentives to put in a mini split heat pump system. Okay. Uh, and they would do a 50% weatherization match if we installed a heat pump. So in other words, if we were to put the vapor barrier in the crawl space and take out all the old insulation and put the new insulation in, we may be able to get a 50% match for that project. Um, how long was that good for? Them? Well, he did say, you know, kind of a strike while the iron is hot. Um, <laughs> the money is available now for municipalities, but it may not be available in the future. So I don't know whether that's something we want to move fast on. We'd have to put people who are in there someplace else where we did all that stuff, I would think. We would. Um, I guess it depends on what we end up doing. But maybe sooner rather than later, we should get someone. The insulation of the vapor barrier part is not the difficult part because that's not all that time consuming. And I'm not sure we have to, we wouldn't have to vacate the building in order to do that work. It's maybe whatever you want. Reinforcing the floors. Right. And right. So. 
whatever else he said. But in any event, I just wanted to mention it because he mentioned it while he was sitting there. Um, also, because I had the gentleman that did the LEDs here, um, he took a walk around and he's going to give me a number um, replacing the lights in Town Hall because the lights are terrible in Town Hall. It's kind of dark in there. So. Have, have we checked into any mobile office type spaces? Mm -hmm. what, they, what they cost? Mm -hmm. What it would take to set them up? Yep. You will get a presentation from the TCPC for that. So we have Good. a price in terms of putting a modular in. We have a price in terms of um, kind of a price in terms of utilizing some space at the traffic circle. Yeah, and there's two storefronts available yep. there. Yep. Well, the one we got pricing on is the old um, Ranger Shack. Oh, yeah. It's about 2,000 square feet. So you'll get some options in terms of doing that. So part of the presentation will be options for the town center, but also in terms of you'll get those uh, as temporary options in terms of if you had to vacate for some reason. One of the things that you asked for is, you know, what if we have to get out of town hall like now? So yeah, we're exploring those particular options. So. Good. Okay. Sounds good. So again, just everybody keep that on their radar screen. There is money available now mm -hmm. to, to subsidize that work. So. Uh, and obviously, once I have the estimate for the LEDs for Town Hall, I'll bring that back to the board. How, how firm of a number do we have on, if you would, for the word, refurbishing Town Hall? Well, the, the quote we got was uh, 398000 for doing the whole thing, the structure that they are at the moment. Um, one of the options we're looking at is in terms of if we add it on, how much would that be? Okay. Um, you get into some setback issues um, yes, with that yeah. one. Mm -hmm. So, but that's something the committee's working on. We're cognizant of our deadline, so we're working on those particular options. I just wondered if we had a number in our mind, so 300 and 398 is what we got from before. The issue is, in terms of the quote that we got, we're not completely sure exactly what that covers. Did that um, come from the architects? It came from the Valley of Britzing, I believe. So the part that's kind of, I don't want to say nebulous, but in terms of what they're actually going to do underneath the floor. Mm -hmm. you know, we got vapor barrier issues, we have structural issues. But what does that 398 cover? Yes. Uh, we had uh, the gentleman, um, from Riddell Construction, uh, but meter come in, and the number that we were talking about at that time was almost 450. So we're in the ballpark. 60,000 is a lot difference, but uh, he was pretty confident that he could get that whole thing done in terms of for about $450,000. So, mm -hmm. But once again, you've got to get the people that are in there yeah. someplace else temporarily when you're doing all that yeah. stuff inside. So. But at the same time, you know, um, the original plans for a modification for the town hall was not as an office building. Right. That's, we're also giving you that option too. Yes. So what if you made it an office building? Um, we're not exactly keen on that idea, but you know. Well, I'm not keen either, so that's why I'm bringing it up. The other thing we have to consider well, is just which like. One? Making the existing town hall a true town hall. Mm -hmm. Because so, it's not the character of the. Well, the way it's set up now, it's not yeah. designed for it. Um, one of the things like the town administrator just brought up in terms of it's always nice when somebody else pays your bills. Sure. So okay. one of the things we also have considered when we're doing renovations for that structure is getting somebody else to help pay for it. You better believe it. Um, and uh, utilizing money from LCHIP and most places, stuff like that. So the thought was, speaking to those people, that they could probably cover half of that. And so like 200000 that's what we talked about putting money aside. Mm -hmm. In terms of matching. So it's always nice when you get somebody else to help tell you your expenses. So you have to keep that in mind as well. So, yes. Next. Uh, 2019 tax warrant. Um, this is obviously based on the 2018 tax rate because it's the first period of 2019. Um, I believe the tax collector intends to get the tax bills out this week. Mm -hmm. The assessor tells me that we have about $8 million more in valuation than we did in 2018, which could prove to be helpful, depending on how certain large abatement issues go. Yes, I'm going to ask, is that include the abatements that are in here? No, it doesn't. Um, no. No. Uh, you also 
also had in your agenda packet a draft of um, an audit RFP. I'd like to get this out the door as soon as possible because, quite frankly, it's going to be August before we know it. Yep. Um, so did anybody have any questions on it? No. I no. like the thing that you put in terms of they have to get it done before right. yeah, like December. Right. So. I don't have any problems with it. No. Okay. So the current firm is good for this year. This would be for next year. No, this would, this would be for fiscal year 19's audit. Oh, so, oh, okay. Yeah. Get that thing over here so we can sign it and get it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm good with that. So, okay, we'll get that out the door. Uh, I think that's all I have. Okay. Um, uh, move to accept. Oh, I got something. Oh, oh, sorry. I just, you asked about a sex tip, <clears throat> and then when she said no, there was a look of concern. We, the highway department, is actively um, burying people right now. Just so you know, we're not. <laughs> we're, that, we're, we're, in the, we're in the process. We're, we're making it work to get everything the right way. And you have a firm. I noticed in the uh, the manifest that you're using a firm to dig the, the grave themselves. So yeah, right. Matt Ryan came in and done one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the only full body that we we did a cremation that full body and then there's like seven or eight more cremations that need to go in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're working with the cemetery trustees to make it work. Yeah, I mean Pete and Warren are doing it, mm -hmm. and Randy is helping. Okay. A little, but we're getting it to make it work. Mm -hmm. I just saw like a look of concern when you like you said you didn't have one yet. I just wanted to reassure you that well, sure. it's I'm hoping somebody will push somebody into it or find somebody else. Well, I just want to let you know that we're making it work, so there's no there's no I issues. I appreciate stuff that. not happening. Back up, yeah. Okay. And we don't want any bodies floating around. <laughs> no. <Yeah. clears throat> All right. Anything else? Number eight. Move to accept the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a second? Sorry. Any discussion? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 I was going to say we want to do the non public first and come back to all the signs. Um, there's a lot to sign. There's a lot to sign. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, so if we just. Sure. Even though we accepted it, we can move on. Okay. Sure. Uh, item number nine. I move to enter in non public session the RMPRSA 91 A 413. Uh, two, um, subsections A and C. Do I have a second? Sorry. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Uh, Mr. Brown. Brown. Yes. Mr. Mr. Brown says Brown. Mr. Brown, Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Bugley, yes. Julie, can you come in? Public meeting, meeting minutes. Do I have a second? second. All those in favor? Aye. We need a roll call. Motion. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pass. Oh, sorry, that's right. Um, Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. LaForce? Yes. Mr. Bobby? Yes. Mm -hmm. I added. He said on the side, so okay. if you can't read it, let us let you know. Do you do we want to start the signing with that? Because yes, that worked out better. No than offense to Mr. Brown, but it did seem to move faster. <laughs> <laughs> Which, <laughs> okay. What? Slid right over. We didn't even know it. It's kind of weird because you'd think it would. You know, is there a bottleneck it around this place? Difference. You don't know what slow is. <laughs> <laughs> Until he gets to this end of the table. That's right. Either well, way, he's very. Either way, it has to come through it's here. Gonna, <laughs> way, it's gonna come I know, but it's somehow. Well, you know I, I signed every single I one. Know, of them. I, I know. I just, it, it just works better this way. I don't know why. Is that know. right? Yeah. yeah. It's flowing downhill, I guess. Okay. And that's what it is. <laughs> oh, God, don't go there. John, you didn't even sign this one. Well, it went so fast. <laughs> Look, it's 
see? See why it has to go back? <laughs> this one.
Jones.